First, we welcome Eric Klangenberg. Dr. Klangenberg is a professor of sociology and the director of the Institute for Public Knowledge at New York University. Next, we have Dr. Vivek Shandas. Vivek Shandas is a professor of climate adaptation and the director of the Sustaining Urban Places Research Lab at Portland State University. Thank you both for joining us today. We are so happy to be, that you're here with us. And I first wanna start with a check-in. Um, how are you doing today? And tell us a little bit more about yourself, something that's not already in your bio and how that motivates the work that you do. So I'll turn it over to Eric first. Well, well, thank you. It's uh, it, it's nice to be here. Although I have to admit, I don't really know where here is anymore or what here really means. I will tell you that I'm speaking to you from uh, historical uh, Lenape land uh, in New York City, and also that I'm sitting in an office that I've been in about three times uh, in the last year and a half. So, uh, my apologies for not arranging my bookshelf. I will say one thing you don't know about me um, that will help understand where I'm coming from in this talk is that I grew up in one of America's most famously divided cities. We have a lot of them. Uh, my, my, the place I grew up in is Chicago, and I'll talk a little bit about it in a few minutes. Uh, but it was really growing up in Chicago that I learned how much place matters for our health and our well-being and all kinds of other outcomes. It's a city that for just about everyone uh, is marked with places that feel like home and places that are often called no-go areas. Uh, and spatial segregation organized my life in ways that I, I still have to work hard to come to terms with. Uh, and in some ways, I think my, my research, which is increasingly about issues of climate and health uh, and, and the kind of physical makeup of, of the places we live uh, has been motivated by those early experiences. Thank you so much, Eric. And now I'll turn it over to Vivek. Hello, it's wonderful to be here. I come to you from um, Portland, Oregon in the Pacific Northwest, uh, um, traditional and current uh, homelands of the Tualatin, the Clackamath, the Kalapuya, the Multnomah, Tumwater, and the Watlala bands of the Chinook, um, many and many other tribes that live along a um, river known as um, Wachal or Columbia. Um, I am um, coming to you as a socio-spatial scientist, and I think that is the public uh, uh, image, but I think what I would like to at least describe is a um, background of true um, kind of migration from eight degrees above the equator where I was born and raised to a place in Northern California and to kind of grapple with some of those transformations of culture, of, of food, of friendships of family and trying to reconcile that throughout my life has been really a lesson in understanding privilege, understanding um, the other and trying to find ways to integrate my own scholarship as well as my uh, identity within a culture that's in rapid transformation, it feels. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, Vivek, for sharing. Um, I'm just going to turn the mic over to you, Eric, um, to give us your presentation, followed by Vivek. So thank you so much. So it looks like you have disabled my screen sharing. So you probably need to enable it before we move forward. There we go. Thank you. OK. Are you seeing something that's much more attractive than me at this point? Hopefully you are. Okay, good. So uh, this is just the uh, image of the uh, a book I wrote recently called Palaces for the People, uh, which is about a concept I've been developing that will be relevant for today called social infrastructure. And it's an argument I've been making about how social infrastructure matters and how investing in it can help us uh, with a variety of things we care about from inequality to uh, politics, to our capacity to, to, to deal with uh, the climate change that at this point is inevitable. And I wanna tell you today about um, how this idea developed and, and, and what I think it, it matters for. And I also wanna say as, as we get going uh, that we're talking about place and displacement with respect to climate. Uh, and, and I guess I, 
I want to be clear that I think the significance of, of place and displacement isn't just about what happens after climate change. Uh, I want to make sure we understand that uh, place matters and displacement matters uh, for how we experience climate change and how we experience many other things. It produces the kind of vulnerability that we then find ourselves needing to address. So it's not, it's, there's not a simple cause and effect story here. And I think we need to be very clear about that. Uh, I learned this lesson very early. The, the first uh, book I wrote uh, began as my dissertation uh, uh, in the late 1990s was, was about a study of, of, this, of my home city, Chicago. Uh, Chicago, as many people know, gets very hot in the summer. You, you're from Milwaukee. Uh, Milwaukee gets just as hot. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it feels like it's baking much of the time in, in June and July and August, and it did when, when I was a kid. But uh, it's getting even hotter. And that's, of course, the case in, in cities throughout the world. It's getting hotter. It's getting more humid. Heat waves are lasting longer uh, and are proving to be more consequential and dangerous. Uh, we got a preview of what's coming in 1995. For just a few days, the, the heat, in, the heat uh, got to about 106 in the heat index, uh, which is the experienced heat of a typical person, got over 125. And, and of course, climate scholars are concerned about what we call urban heat islands. Uh, cities, because of all the development, all the asphalt, all the steel, uh, they tend to um, heat up more than surrounding suburban and rural areas. And pollution that gets concentrated in the city in cities tends to trap heat. Uh, so uh, in cities, you, we not only have extreme heat during the day, but also high low temperatures at night. And that means it's becoming increasingly difficult for people uh, who live in cities to get um, any kind of natural relief uh, from, 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 from weather unless they have air conditioning. And Chicago is a big story because uh, after a heat wave that lasted just a few days, uh, the, the city began to break down. There were massive fatalities. Uh, we, we knew things were dangerous because the infrastructure, the kind of traditional hard infrastructure for Chicago began to falter. Uh, the, the power plants, substations, uh, you know, were, were malfunctioning. The city didn't really have a great plan for keeping the energy going uh, when it got extremely hot. In very poor neighborhoods, the traditional um, practice is to open up fire hydrants to try to keep cool because people don't have a lot of air conditioning. Well, we know now that when the power is out in a city, it means you know you can't pump water up to high-rise buildings, right? It means you can't take elevators up and down. So getting access to uh, so, so if you lose power, you lose water, you lose elevators. Uh, and it means that what happens on the street matters more. Uh, and in Chicago, there were people who were opening up. So many people were opening fire hydrants in some areas uh, that neighborhoods lost water pressure while they had no power, some for a few days. And of course, the transit lines failed. The train rails began to buckle. Uh, uh, bridges weren't opening and closing, closing uh, neatly. Uh, there was traffic jam everywhere. And... What I want you to think about as I present this, uh, these you know, kind of fuzzy photographs from long ago, 1995, is how well is the place you live prepared for the kind of heat that we're about to experience or that maybe you experienced this summer? You, pr you probably have read at this point that one third of all Americans experienced a so-called natural disaster, an extreme weather event uh, in the summer of 2021. So do you feel confident that the place where you live is ready to continuously deliver electricity, uh, you know, in the event of a severe heat wave or storm. Is your is your power grid up to snuff? Uh, what about your transit system? What about your water system? Uh, is it where it needs to be? Well, in Chicago, what happened is it clearly wasn't. The infrastructure broke down, uh, and people started to break down. Uh, thousands of people in excess of the norm got sick. Uh, hundreds began dying. Uh, in some ways, this is a preview for what we've experienced in the pandemic, uh, and you know what, what certainly what, what, what New York experienced: uh, the hospitals being overwhelmed, uh, the emergency rooms overwhelmed. In Chicago, they had no system for monitoring which hospitals had the capacity to take new people into emergency rooms and which did not, uh, and it meant that they went on bypass status, and uh, they, and and ambulances had to drive all through the city to find a place. Uh, where they could treat people. And again, it's something that we saw in COVID, but something we need to be asking ourselves when we think about how place matters as the world becomes hotter. 
which people and which places have easy access uh, to a lot of, of hospital uh, uh, buildings, to healthcare centers, to good doctors. Uh, if there's an emergency situation and we have to provide acute care, who is going to have good access and good service and who will not? Well, there was a massive spike in deaths in Chicago, uh, 521 heat-related deaths, which were diagnosed, uh, 739 deaths in excess of the norm. And, you know, this is somewhat shocking in 1995, the heat wave blasted just a couple of days. Of course, what we've lived through in the past year and a half is, you know, multiple heat waves every day. Uh, and I, I fear that we've grown numb to that kind of damage, but I want to take it seriously, uh, just as I did at the time. And because I was training to become a sociologist uh, when, it, when this uh, happened, the first thing I wanted to do was use a kind of traditional sociological research method, which is drawing maps of different neighborhoods to understand you know, who died and, and where they died. And when I first drew a map of mortality in Chicago, what I noticed uh, is something that's, you know, I think politically important. It matters for our concerns about injustice uh, and health equity and climate equity, uh, which is that the neighborhoods on the west side and the south side of Chicago, the historic black belt of Chicago, places that are very segregated, very poor, uh, fared much worse than the typical neighborhood in the city. The, the concentrations of death were exactly where you would expect them to be. And this meant that, you know, as a young scholar, I had this predicament because, uh, again, I, th I think these patterns are politically just of the utmost significance. But scientifically, they didn't create any puzzles for people because and this is one of the, I think, the urgent problems with the way that we relate to climate and health and well-being. It's not a deep scientific puzzle why some people in some places fare so much worse than others and some fare better. It, it, it's pretty clear to us that everyday vulnerabilities, everyday inequalities will translate into inequalities when it comes to extreme events. We, we know that very well. The, the, the scientific puzzle here is kind of a social, sociological one. Why is it that we know this in advance and fail to do something about it? Why have we been so poor at protecting people in places who we know to be in trouble? <laughs> Why is it that our knowledge of what is about to happen uh, moves us so little? That is a really deep and, and challenging question. It's not exactly a climate science question. It's kind of a political science question. Uh, and it's one that all of us face. So I noticed this. But I, I noticed something else that very few people had seen. And this is where the, you know, my story about social infrastructure become, becomes more interesting. I noticed that while it was true that overall in Chicago, uh, neighborhoods that were black and segregated and poor did much worse than everyone else. Uh, uh, on the other hand, when I looked at the neighborhoods in Chicago that had the lowest death rates in the city, when I looked at the places that were most resilient, to use the language we use today, uh, I saw something that no one had seen, which is that uh, a number of those neighborhoods were also poor and black and segregated. And in many cases, they lived across the, they, they were located across the street, literally across the street from a neighborhood that was one of the highest death places in Chicago. So if what that tells us is that if the neighborhoods that are most resilient are across the street from the neighborhoods that are uh, the most vulnerable, and if the demographic composition is the same, in other words, they're both the neighborhoods are black, both the neighborhoods are very poor, both the neighborhoods are segregated, uh, have similar levels of older people living there. If the de demography is similar, the outcomes are very different, then as much as we understand that race and poverty and segregation are part of the story of why the overall pattern works the way it does, we need to get more granular and specific scientifically to understand how places operate. And this is where my research really began to take off. So I noticed in Chicago, there are two kinds of very poor places uh, and, they, and they work differently. We're talking about, you know, Mindy Fullalove was on the panel before me. Dr. Fullalove has done extraordinary research on how place matters and how depopulation matters and abandonment and disinvestment uh, and fires char the landscape. And there are a number of neighborhoods in Chicago that are not just poor and black and segregated, but that also are depleted. They have lost enormous amounts of population. They have lost physical infrastructure. They've lost housing units. They've lost retail outlets. They've lost uh, businesses. Uh, when, you, when you walk around them, they look like this. And this, for those of you who are not from big cities, is not a healthy green space. Uh, this is uh, 
These are empty lots with you know weeds and detritus and broken glass. And if you live in a, in a neighborhood that's poor and that looks like this, especially if you're older and more frail, uh, you don't really have a lot that's drawing you out into the public realm. Uh, you, you, you tend to hunker down and get isolated. And in fact, people in Chicago who lived in neighborhoods like this were the most likely to die. But there are a bunch of very poor neighborhoods in Chicago, uh, black and brown and, and, and some white ones as well that look like this. And uh, it, they are poor and in many cases they are segregated. Uh, but what they have is a kind of, what I've come to think of as a social infrastructure that is intact. They have uh, sidewalks that work. Uh, they have uh, stoops where people come and, and sit out. They do not have empty lots and abandoned buildings. Uh, they have a retail sector that is flourishing. They have community organizations uh, that can be supported. Uh, they have public institutions like libraries that work well. And if you live in a neighborhood like this, if you're, if you're poor you're, and there's segregation, you will, you will deal with a whole bunch of problems that are really acute and serious. And I don't wanna overlook them, but you're very unlikely to die in a heat wave compared to your neighbors because this, it's the social infrastructure of a neighborhood that uh, pulls people out and brings them into public life where they're more likely to have interactions that can be, be supportive. And they're supportive every day as well as in crises. So what I learned is that during the heat wave in Chicago, if you lived in, in, in this neighborhood, this is an image of a place called Englewood on the south side, you were 10 times more likely to die in the heat wave than if you lived in this neighborhood, which is called Auburn Gresham, which is literally right across the street from Englewood. And I, and I have research that, that looks at this for a number of different neighborhoods in Chicago and that patterns it, patterns it out more generally as well. And, and what I learned from this research is you know, it's, it's, it's social infrastructure that makes an enormous difference uh, on a variety of things. The, I should tell you the life expectancy in this neighborhood, regardless of the weather, is five years longer than it is in this neighborhood, even though it's across the street. You get five years of extra life from living in a place that has uh, this stronger social infrastructure in Chicago. So this is, this is something that really matters and that we need to attend to. So when I say social infrastructure, what I'm referring to are physical places uh, that show that that shape how people interact. Uh, and just looking at my time. Uh, and when we invest in social infrastructure, uh, when we when we build it well, when we design it well, when we program it and manage it, we get all kinds of returns to our our social life, to our health and well-being. And when we let it fall apart, we suffer in a number of ways. I want to wrap up by uh, talking for just a couple minutes about. Uh, work I, I did in New York City in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy is not a heat event, uh, but a, a water event. Again, the, the, the power went out. Again, the hard infrastructure uh, fell apart with uh, terrible consequences. Uh, but again, social life mattered in many ways. Uh, after uh, Sandy, uh, President Obama started something called the Rebuild by Design Competition. Actually, Dr. Fola participated in this uh, as a, a, a research expert, uh, I was asked to be the research director for this project. And I got to work with these teams of uh, engineers and architects and landscape uh, designers, uh, climate scientists from around the world who came to the region to think about, you know, how do you help to rebuild a city that, you know, when it's typically photographed, looks one way, but when it's drawn on a map that shows you flood risks, looks very different. Uh, in, in our competition, groups were trying to grapple with what it means to, to, to protect a place where the seas are rising, where it's getting hotter uh, at a dramatic pace. And of course, these are questions that every community on earth needs to face right now. And of course, it's worth noting that New York City has probably more capacity to deal with this problem than just about any place. Uh, it's in the United States. It's the capital of capitalism. There's extraordinary wealth and scientific expertise and political will to do things. Yet, uh, the, the number of things that you would have to do uh, to deal with risks for uh, displacement in New York City are overwhelming. And the designs that wound up emerging from this competition uh, with funding uh, were located all over the city in a bunch of different places. And, and, and you know, we... we for years never really thought about New York City as the kind of place that would have to deal with hurric major hurricanes and inundation, uh, you know, but, but Sandy brought the kind of weather 
that we're starting to see more frequently. This summer was another big wake up call. Uh, this is what the Lower East Side looked like in the aftermath of Sandy. And so the, the question for, um, for, for cities, for nations around the world is, uh, how do you do enough mitigation uh, so that you can make adaptation and, and protection of vulnerable people and places possible? You, you, you we'll never be able to adapt to climate change if we fail to mitigate, which means we, we have to convert to renewable energy and stop burning greenhouse gases as soon as possible. But then we face this question that I'm going to leave you with because I know my time is running short uh, and there's a lot of conversations to have. And the question is, if we're going to start spending money to, to protect certain people in certain places, if we decide that some people in some places are worth protecting uh, from rising seas that will inevitably claim some parts of the land and make it impossible for some people to be settled where they are. How on earth are we going to decide which people and places are going to get the resources they need to stay where they are? Because all of us feel that the land we're on is sacred in some way, right? How are we going to, how are we going to make a decision about which people and places get the resources they need to protect themselves? And how are we going to decide uh, which places we are going to abandon, uh, give back to mother nature uh, as we face the next round of threats. I, I think this is a non-trivial problem. And I think it's one that we have failed to square up to. Uh, it is going to call up all kinds of questions about uh, uh, power and inequality uh, and hierarchy and expertise. Uh, uh, it's going to be a question of uh, who we are and what we value and where we value. And I want to suggest uh, before we uh, break and have the next presentation and get into conver to conversation that, that when, we, when we speak of spatial justice, uh, we need to have an open time frame, and we need to see this problem uh, in historical context, uh, as well as uh, with the capacity to project forward. Uh, this is going to be one of the key problems and challenges of our time we're dealing with already. Uh, we had to deal with it and rebuild by design. President Obama said we're going to we're going to fund protection on the Lower East Side, for instance, which is an area that has a lot of poverty and a lot of public housing. Some of you might share my view that the president who came after President Obama would probably not have prioritized uh, the spending in the same way. So so leadership matters. Our political decisions matter, and we're just getting started. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eric, for your great presentation. And thank you for leaving us with very, very important questions to reflect on and underscoring how social infrastructure can make the difference between someone's well-being and, and lifespan.